Welcome back to Chem 21, Preparation of Salicylic Acid. This is the third and final section of this laboratory experiment. In this portion of the experiment, we will be purifying and analyzing our salicylic acid product, starting by recrystallizing it from water. We begin by adding a small amount of water from a graduated cylinder that originally had 10 milliliters of water exactly it it in it. Mm. We add just enough water to cover the crystals and then place it immediately on the hot plate. When you're crystallizing from water, it's okay to put your recrystallizing mixture directly onto the hot plate and set it at a temperature that would boil the water. With a boiling stick added, we can now bring the solution to a boil and add pre-warmed water until it just dissolves at a slow boil. We continue to check if the solid has dissolved yet and add water slowly in small increments in order to make sure that it dissolves just at the boiling point. It appears now that there is a little solid left so we will continue to heat it and add water slowly. After each addition of water, we carefully bring the solution back to a boil again. Once we are sure that all of the solid has dissolved, it will be safe to take it off the heat. At this point, we can measure with the graduated cylinder how much water is left and determine how much water was added to this mixture. You can see the solution cooling slowly on the bench top. And there's how much water is left in the cylinder. We remove the boiling stick and within just a few seconds the crystals begin to form as they sit on the bench top. We continue to let the solution cool and crystallize on the bench top and once it is close to room temperature we can then place it in the ice bath. Once in the ice bath, the crystals will continue to form and we will be able to maximize our yield by lowering the temperature of the solution. You can see here how many crystals have formed in the solution at this point. We collect the crystals by vacuum filtration just as with the crude product and then let the crystals thoroughly dry before going on to the next step. We pre-weigh a clean and dry empty watch glass and then add our crystals to the watch glass and re-weigh. The purified crystals look significantly different than the precipitate of the crude product in that they look like small needles have formed. Once we have our mass, 
We can then take the melting point of the pure crystals using the Meltemp apparatus. We place our eye in front of the magnifying eyepiece and watch the crystals to see when they begin to melt and when they're finished melting. This is an image of the crystals as they are just about to melt. You can see that at this stage, the crystals have shrunk from their original size right as they are about to melt. At this point, we take the crystals to the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Lab for a carbon NMR. The first thing we have to do is transfer the crystals into the NMR tube. It's much like a melting point capillary, but a bit wider, about 5 millimeters in diameter. Once we have enough sample, we can then add the deuterated acetone solvent. You should be able to see that the salicylic acid is readily soluble in this solvent. Mixing lines are readily visible in the solution as it forms in the tube. Once we have the appropriate amount of solvent added, usually a few centimeters in height, then we ensure that all of the solvent has mixed by capping the tube and then inverting it several times to make sure all of the solute has dissolved and we have a homogeneous solution. Then we place the tube in a spinner. Make sure that the tube is at the appropriate height to be analyzed by the instrument. And then it's time to place the sample with the spinner into the magnet. You can see the sample will go down into the center of the large superconducting magnet. At this point, we can start collecting the data. Here you see the time domain magnetic resonance signal forming, where the x-axis is time and we have a wave pattern, a complex wave pattern that is formed. The frequencies of each one of our carbon added, carbon 13 atoms in our sample is found in this pattern. We can then transform this pattern into a frequency domain where each one of the lines now represents a frequency of a specific carbon atom in our molecule. The two large lines on the outside represent the solvent peaks, as they too have carbon atoms in them. You can see that the peaks are getting taller and more visible as we scan the sample more and more. Eventually when the scans are complete, it's time to process the data. You can see we are marking the frequency then of each one of these peaks, which represent the carbon atoms of salicylic acid. On top is the time domain data, and on the bottom is the frequency domain data. We can remove the time domain data just prior to printing the sample. This is the end of the salicylic acid lab. Thank you for watching, and come back for more Chem 21 labs in the future.